Tonight we're looking at Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13. If you remember from this morning, we looked at verses 14 through 30, a totally different subject, but really ultimately kind of the same thing. You see, Jesus has a lot of these parables in uh, the Bible where he, he tried to present a good truth in a way that was easy to understand and remember for us. Uh, so we're going to be looking at one of those parables tonight, one that uh, says that we need to examine our own lives and make sure that we are prepared when the Master comes that He will find us true and faithful and ready to meet Him. And it's a very important thing to do. If you don't want to use your handouts, of course, you're welcome to check in your Bible. Um, Elizabeth, did you hand out those last few? Okay. Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13. And if you could, as we uh, could stand as we read the King James Version here this evening. Matthew 25, 1 through 13. All right, Matthew 25, 1 through 13, where it says here, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they were ready. They that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. And he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. It's a pretty um, powerful warning, I think, to us today. But we need to be very careful. There's a lot of reasons in, in here tonight that we'll get into in a moment, but we as Christians need to be careful to make sure that we aren't like these foolish virgins who think we're prepared, but leave a few things undone. We need to make sure that we've got everything in line and in order when the Master comes to take His bride home. Lord, we thank You for this Word tonight. We just pray You'd help us to do our best to honor and to glorify You in it, to rightly divide it, Lord. Hide us behind Your cross tonight and help us to uh, obey Your Spirit's uh, speaking to us. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. And so I, I'm going to go ahead and read my paraphrase there. I'm not going to go down through it as I have with the Sermon on the Mount. I've, I'm doing things a little bit differently here. But I'll go ahead and read down through there. And if you want to follow along, I think that uh, some of the things I was able to bring out when I was going through here do help to clarify some of what was being said. So it says here, Then the kingdom of heaven will be compared to ten virgins which took their lamps and went out to meet the groom. And five of them were wise, that's thoughtful, intelligent, and cautious, and five were foolish, that's heedless, stupid blockheads. Uh, they that were foolish brought their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise brought oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the groom delayed, all of them nodded off and fell asleep. And in the middle of the night an outcry was made, Behold, the groom is coming, go out to meet him. Then all those virgins woke up and put their lamps in order. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us of you from your oil, because our lamps have gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not at all. There is not enough for us and you. Now go instead to those who sell, and buy for yourselves. And they went to buy, the groom came, and those that were ready entered in with him to the wedding. And the door was closed. And eventually the other virgins also came, saying, Sir, Master, open for us. But he responded and said, Surely I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake accordingly, because you do not know the day nor the hour, the season of time, in which the Son of Man comes. It's a pretty scary thought to be those virgins. Eventually they came back, but it was too late. The door was shut. They had no way in. No access. No hope. Not another chance. One chance. One opportunity. And all of us are appointed once to die and then the judgment. And that once at death, that's our, our opportunity to be ready. Or that once in the rapture, that's our opportunity to be ready. We don't get a do-over. We don't get a second chance. If you miss it the first time, 
Too bad. You've missed it. At least that's what I've found in all of my studies. It, sure, it certainly doesn't seem like there's too much hope for very many people, even in the rapture, to be saved besides a handful of Jews that are going to be saved when they wake up finally. God's going to give them just that little extra grace. That's all the Bible says for sure, is that some of the Jews will get a chance again. But for us, there doesn't seem to be another chance. We've had the word. We've had the warning. We've had the time to prepare. Be prepared, or else when the door shuts, that'll be it. So we're going to look at three parts here tonight that are in this parable, three parts of this story that Jesus uh, presented right away in verse 1, and that is that there are the virgins, the lamps, and the groom. Those three parts are the most important parts in this parable. A parable is a story that compares uh, a most of the time fictional story, but sometimes a real story with perhaps a little exaggeration to something that's real. And it applies one part to another part in real life. So one thing stands in for another. So when you're talking about a lamb, it might stand in for another person kind of thing. In this case, the, there are the ten virgins that are the central character that we need to look at. The lamps, which are the most important thing, the item here for them to be taken care of, and the groom, who is the one person they need to please. I want to go through each of these, analyze what we know for sure, speculate just a little bit, and bring a conclusion out that will require a decision from each of us and a continuous decision. It's not a decision that can be made once and done. It's a decision we have to make and keep making in our lives. Jesus often used these parables, these moral stories, to explain complex biblical truths in a way that would be easy to comprehend. In fact, most of the time, young kids can get these pretty quickly, and us older and older and older don't seem to get it quite as quickly when we hear it for the first time. Young people, they seem to understand, oh, that makes perfect sense. We older ones don't seem to get it as quickly. Jesus was always speaking to the heart of a child. He said, unless you get that same understanding that a child has, that simple understanding and faith, you're not going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. So we have three uh, different aspects of this story. The first one is the virgins, which is split into two categories. Those who are prepared and those who aren't. The ones who are going to be victorious and faithful and those who are lazy, slothful, worthless, blockheads, and end up missing their opportunity. So in this, ver this parable, there are ten virgins. The number really doesn't hold any particular significance, although numbers in uh, the Hebrew world did mean a lot of things back in the day, like eight and twelve both meant to be complete. Seven was a perfect number. Six was the number for men. Ten really isn't that big of a deal. It's nothing special, especially in this story. It's just Jesus saying, here's a number, let's divide it. Uh, in the same way, I often tell stories, and, I, and I'm trying to explain something, I'll express it, and I'll say, just imagine that there's ten, and one of them is this, and you know, that kind of a thing. He's simply saying, there are ten. Just imagine a group of ten. And you could imagine it being a hundred, fifty and fifty, but even then, the numbers aren't what's important here. It's the attitudes of the heart and what they're doing and, and their preparation that matters. So the number isn't that big of a deal. It's just Jesus saying there's a group of people, uh, in this case, who are preparing to be the brides at a wedding. All ten of them are getting ready to marry this groom. And during that time, that was acceptable. It's not today. Don't think about it that way. And, and Jesus himself said that he that God wants it to be one man and one woman, not ten women and one man, okay? So, ten brides, just for getting that out of the way. Jesus doesn't ask who is the wise and who is the foolish. Very often in his parables he would say, who do you think was the neighbor to this man? Who do you think was the wise person in this story? And make you think about it. But here he doesn't even leave that up to you. He doesn't even ask you. He just f plainly says, five of them were very wise and they did this. Five of them were very foolish and they did that. He made it very clear. He didn't want any misunderstanding. He said that, that these people were, uh, some were very wise, they were thoughtful, they were careful to prepare. Some were very uh, unintelligent and didn't have any real understanding of what they should have been doing. Um, then, does, that, that does not mean that people who are not intelligent doesn't re don't reach heaven, okay? Don't take that either. He's not saying they are ignorant in book smarts. He's saying they're ignorant in the common sense to do what they know they're supposed to do. They have no wisdom, no understanding of doing what they should be doing. And so these foolish virgins come to the, the place of waiting right alongside the wise. They're all headed to the wedding, 
just as we're all headed to a final judgment someday where we will be separated into two categories, the righteous and the wicked, the wheat and the tares, the sheep and the goats. We're going to be separated in two categories. Jesus often made it clear there's only two categories that you can fit into. It doesn't matter what you believe. It just matters if you're believing the one thing that's right or anything else. And everything else is that second category, the tares, uh, the unrighteous, the goats, and here the foolish virgins. Not, uh, not one of these was just flat out destined and intended to be left out. They were all meant to be the bride. Do you understand that? All of them were intended to marry the groom, just as every one of us is intended to reach heaven one day. God wants us all to be saved. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the whole world through him might be saved. He wants all to come to repentance and none to perish. The Bible is clear about it. He doesn't want a single one of us to be lost. And it's not his choice whether we be lost because he's left that choice in our hands. He's given us the access. He's, as I said this morning, given us the parachute. We've got to decide to pull. You understand? So all of these had the opportunity to make it in. All of the virgins slumbered and slept. It says that word all in that verse specifically where they slumbered and slept means the entirety of them, completely encircling every one of them And those two words, I've heard some preachers talk about it and say, well, maybe slumbering means they're kind of dozing off and sleeping means they fell asleep. No, slumbering means they fell asleep and sleeping means they fell into more of a sleep and possibly death. But it just means they all fell asleep. They all kind of nodded off until finally the last one fell asleep. They all dozed off. They were all tired of waiting. And unfortunately, in our day and age, it seems like a lot of us are getting kind of tired of waiting. It seems like a lot of people are getting impatient And as a result, there are two categories. There are some who decide no longer to believe and others who believe but are really wondering, why is it taking so long? We really want to get this over with. It seems like those are the two categories we wind up with today. But all of these were slumbering and sleeping. Uh, It could mean that they were just going about their lives, sort of like in the days of Noah, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. We're going to be going through our lives, living our normal course of life. We're going to be sleeping, eating, drinking, working, and doing all of those other things, just like the rest of the world. In that respect, there won't be any difference between us and them. It doesn't matter what we're physically doing. That's not what's going to save us. As long as we're here and prepared, that's the important thing. They were doing the same exact thing. If what they were doing here mattered, then, you know, a certain uh, special way of eating and drinking and sleeping and doing all of this, then he would have been more clear on that. But that doesn't matter. That's not what's important. It doesn't matter how you sleep. That's not getting you to heaven. It doesn't matter about your physical acts in this life. That's not going to get you into heaven. Um, Just as in the days of, of Noah, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Some taken, some left behind, but all doing the same things on this earth. They all had lamps. That's another common thing. They all, all of them could have brought enough oil for their lamps. They had the opportunity, as evidenced by how the foolish find oil later on. They had access somewhere to get more oil. They just neglected to do so. They could have went and gotten the oil ahead of time. The lamps are their lives, but we'll get to that shortly. All of them heard the call to come and meet the groom. All of them took stock of their lamps, checked their souls. Some of them found that the lamp was wanting, and some found that their lives were overflowing. They had plenty enough for them to be able to make it to the wedding. The wise could not help the foolish, just as we cannot get saved from someone else. You know, I can't depend on your salvation to get to heaven. I've got to have my own. You've got to have your own. You can't depend on mine. You can't depend on grandma's. You can't depend on anybody else's. Nobody else's lamps have enough oil to fill yours too. You've got to fill your own. You've got to get your own life in order. And if your life is not in order and you don't have the right amount of oil in there, the right amount of God's Word and the Holy Spirit, you're not going to make it. No matter how much I want to give you some of mine, I can't do it. The wise couldn't help the foolish. We can't help those who are unsaved with our own salvation. The very example of them having the extra oil should have been enough for the foolish when they got there to say, oh, we forgot, we need to go back and make up for it. Just as seeing your life should be enough for your neighbors and your family and your friends to say, yeah, I really need to get right with God and do it. But you know what? I've seen it true. Many times, my family, other families, other people that I've met, they'll say, 
you know, yeah, I know I need to get to church. I know I need to get right with God. Not today, maybe next week, maybe next month, maybe next year. The days go on and they never come. Time travels on by nice and quickly. I was talking to Dr. Adley this morning about how fast the year has flown by. For a lot of these people that we've been inviting to church, I'd have to think that the year has flown by quite a bit for them too. And they've not come. And they don't want to. They do, but they really don't. They don't want to be bothered with it. They don't want to be troubled with doing anything more than what they feel they absolutely have to. Because it's just too much of an inconvenience. I think our culture in America has made that worse. If it's not convenient, don't bother with it. If it's not convenient to clean it, toss it in the trash. Disposable economy. Everything we have, we can just chuck it out and get a new one. It's the way we've been for years. And unfortunately, I think it has caused a great detriment in our lives today, in all of America, where people say, it's okay, I can just, it's not a big deal, it's not convenient to me, so I'm going to throw that out of my life and forget about it. Maybe a more convenient time, but right now, it's not important. The unfortunate thing is, the wise entered the wedding, but the foolish went off into darkness, and at the end they were given, once again, the saddest words in history. I do not know you. To hear God say that is going to be the most horrible thing that anybody ever hears in all of history. They're going to have a moment of time where they're hoping and begging, and God's going to say, I don't know you. And they'll be out of his presence and no longer have any presence of God and the joy and the love that God has. God is love. They'll have no love left in all of eternity. God is holiness. They're not going to have any of that. God is joy. They won't have any of that. All of the good things that God gives to us, they'll have none of it. Not even hearing Him speak anymore for all of eternity. For many of them, that's their wish, that God would just shut up and leave them alone. Get out of my life. And unfortunately, that's what's going to happen for all of time and eternity. Those virgins who did not keep care of their lamps properly, at the end of this story, are lost without hope. Forever. Shut out from the wedding and gone. But there's a second part to this story. Not only the virgins, but the lamps. And, and the lamps in this story are supposed to represent our souls, our spiritual life. How are we doing in living for God in this world today? Though we could stretch the parable and maybe say it's talking about how you treat the lamp to your feet, the Word of God, it doesn't really seem to be that, although that could be part of it. Um, the Word of God being a lamp to our feet keeps us from stumbling if we wisely attend to it. But the lamps in our lives, the, our spiritual lives, they need oil to work. They need something to work the same way that an oil lamp, an old-fashioned oil lamp, needs oil to work. For some reason, each person in this tale had to have their own. And like I said, each of us has to have our own in order, in place. God didn't say, it's okay if you kind of share. You know, I find that very fascinating because here's five and five, they could have each shared a lamp and went on. No, Jesus said that's not the way it works. They have to have their own lamp. It has to be in the right place. It has to be working. It has to be lit or they can't come into the wedding the rules. Sort of like the man who came in his old garments whenever there was a big feast for the wedding and Jesus said, I supplied you with good clean clothes and you didn't put them on. Get out into outer darkness. Go out with the dogs. We cannot use someone else's salvation to get to heaven. We cannot use someone else's righteousness to get in. We cannot pay our way in. We cannot do anything to get in besides being saved and living that way. There's no other way. Jesus prescribed one way, and that's through him. Repent and believe. One way. Live that life in faith. The wise virgins had prepared. They had their lamps. They had what the lamps needed to fill them. Their lives were full of God. They were full of the oil, the Holy Spirit. Very often I've heard people, people talk of the Holy Spirit as being the oil to our lamps that keeps us burning and keeps on bringing that joy back up again and again. And, and God, the Holy Spirit, really does bring that joy into our lives. When we have a sweet time of communion with Him, during our time in prayer or during our time in church, when He comes down like He did a few weeks ago, we have some really good times and God can revive us and bring us a new refreshing. The same way this oil brings a new kindled flame to the lamp. The foolish didn't have their oil that they needed to meet the groom. 
You could say that they were so full of themselves, they didn't have room to put him in. Uh, They weren't full of the fuel that was meant to keep the light going. When they all woke up, the virgins took a look at their lamps to make sure of what state they were in. The, The King James uses the word trim, and that is a definition of that word, but really it just means to prepare and put in order. So they were putting in order their lamp. They were making sure that the wick was just the right length and that the oil was in its place and that the cover was on just right and that it was lit. They were making sure everything was in order, that it was as it needed to be. And in this case... They checked to see if there were any leaks. They checked to make sure there was fuel and that it was still burning. The wise had to put some fuel back in their lamps. They needed another dose. And you know what? The encouragement of the Holy Spirit isn't permanent. If you don't stay close to Him, you're not going to be full. But then if you don't stay close to Him, you'll wind up like these uh, foolish virgins who when they checked had no oil left. Their fire had completely gone out. They were now cold, you could say, to God. The wise put some fuel in their lamps lit them back up. The foolish uh, begged for some fuel. Take some time in your own life to check and see if your lamp is in order. Is your lamp trimmed? Are you full of His Word and His Spirit? Is your soul prepared to meet the groom tonight? That's really what's most important, and we need to have this be the continual question on our mind. Is my soul ready to meet God tonight? If God came back right now, What I'm doing, or what I've done today, would that be acceptable in His sight? Or have I lost His presence in my life because of what I'm doing or what I've done? I used to do some things when I was younger that I shouldn't have done. And I will tell you, there were times where I said, God, before I got into it, I prayed and I said, God, just don't come back in the next few minutes. I was foolish. I was so hooked on the things I was doing that I didn't want to get away from them. I wanted God. I was double-minded. That's completely changed now. There's none of that. How are you doing? Is there anything in your life that would keep the oil out? Maybe a little leak that you've caused to come in there that just pours out whatever Holy Spirit comes into you when you come to church. So these wise virgins uh, did the only thing they had that they could do and the only thing we can do, they said, you can go over there and that's the place where you get the oil from. So the foolish virgins went away and did that. Just as we can say, there's Jesus, you can go to Him and you can be prepared. But we can't do anything else for them. The best we can do is point them in the right direction and pray for them and hope that the Lord tarries just a little bit longer. And I think really there's a whole lot of compassionate Christians in the world today who are desperate to see someone saved and that's the only reason Jesus hasn't finished and come back yet. I do believe that. There's a third part to this parable, and that's the groom. The groom is the master. He represents God. The groom has extended a call for all of these virgins to come and to marry him. He wants that all receive this great blessing from him, just as in John 3, chapter, uh, verse 17, it says that all, God wants all to come to repentance. The invitation is available to all, and all have been given the opportunity It's interesting to note that everyone in this parable seems to be seeking heaven. None of them are completely obstinate or indifferent to the groom or his wedding. I don't think these are outright sinners necessarily he's talking about, although one or two of them might have been. I think many of those foolish virgins would be people who go to church, believe they're saved, or at least that they're living mostly right, and that they're living right enough that God's going to just accept it they're pretty fooled in their own selves because they're hoping that they don't have to really meet up to the requirements that he'll kind of squeak them by. Kind of like at times when uh, we've been to places and our kids aren't just aren't quite tall enough to go into that room or do that thing and, and they're like, well, they're close enough. And they push them on in. God's not going to do that. His measuring stick is permanent. If you don't measure up, you're done. You're out. You don't come in. If you're not ready and don't have everything where it should be, you're not in. I know that sounds really cruel, right, in our world where everybody's accepted and everybody gets a participation trophy, but you're not in unless you are completely in. God will not accept a partial offering or sacrifice, obedience or nothing. That's all. So the groom's invitation is for one and all. Many of them want to be there. Five of them are completely prepared. Five of them, although they seem to want to go to heaven, they are not prepared to. 
A lot of people in our world are like that today. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but a lot of them don't want to do what it takes to get there. This message is vital for us to realize and apply to our lives today. We notice that the groom was taking his time. It says he was delaying or tarrying. He was taking his time to make sure everything was just right in the wedding feast. And he was not going to tell them the exact moment that he was going to be ready. He knew when he was going to be ready, but he didn't tell them when he was going to call for them. If he'd have called five minutes sooner, maybe there would have been just enough oil to squeak. No, probably not. But he wasn't going to give them a time. We've got to always be prepared. Because as it says at the end of this passage, we don't know the day. We don't know the season, the hour. We do not know when Jesus is coming back. We're going to hear a whole lot of people saying, he's up in the mountains, he's out in the field, he's over here, he's over there, and they're all wrong. When he comes, we're gone. (laughs) I firmly believe that to be true. He's not going to let anybody see him and begin proclaiming a message of, oh, he's here, he's here, because he told us, when people are doing that, don't believe them. It's not true. When he comes, we're gone. There's no other alternative. (laughs) The groom had called... Uh, it had taken several hours, possibly, maybe even a couple of days to get their feast ready. They didn't know when it was coming. They just knew that they needed to be ready when the call came in. The groom had them called up. He had somebody shout and, and call and tell them, the groom is ready, come on in. Just as one day, the Bible says that Gabriel's going to blow his trumpet, that the eastern skies are going to be parted and Christ is going to come to collect us if we're ready to the feast. It's your choice if you want to be ready. In the end, when the judgment is complete, there will be no second chance. There will be no do-over. The door is shut. If you were not ready when he came to call you home, then you will lose your chance. Now, I hope this only really applies to the final judgment, but as I've been studying this, I'm almost fearful, as I said at the beginning, that after the rapture comes, should the rapture be the way we believe it to be, that there really won't be any hope, much hope, if any, for people to get saved during the time of tribulation. I've heard some say that there might be, but most of the time I've heard, I've heard teachers and preachers tell me they don't believe there will be hope for salvation besides the 144,000 Jews. I'm beginning to believe that more. I don't want to believe it. I want to believe that people will get saved. But it's possible that the, door, the doors will be shut and the last chance will be done. Don't take the chance. It's not worth it. In the end, if you're not ready to be called home when he wants to take you home, It's over. You don't get a do-over. When the foolish came to plead for entrance, it says they eventually came. That word means they came around at some point much later. So they, they took a while to finally get their lives in order in some way to get their lamps back to where they should be. And they came to the entrance and the groom said, I tell you for sure, I don't even know who you are. It's it's the same response, basically, that he gives over and over again. Depart from me. I don't know you, you workers of iniquity. You wicked people. I don't even know who you are. Get out of my face. It's going to be a terrible time for those people. I'm glad I won't have to shed any tears over that because I'd be bawling my eyes out seeing some of my family and friends be rejected by Christ for all of eternity. I'm glad that God wipes away our tears and whatever he does to help us to forget about them or or whatever, I'll be glad for because I don't want to think about where they're going. I don't want to know where they are unless they're in heaven, then I do. When the ones who are not truly saved plead with God in the end, at the judgment, it'll be too late. He will not tell them to, he will tell them to depart for them. He will not open the door and make an exception. But he has no relationship with them, and he doesn't want anything to do with them anymore. It's too late. It isn't because he didn't try. He tries plenty. He's given plenty of opportunities to every one of us. And if you don't make it there, it's because you choose not to. Because he's chosen to tell you over and over again. He has been faithful, and when that day comes that he sends that judgment on you, you will have nothing to say. In response, don't think that you can argue with God or reason with Him. He's the God of the universe who's seen everything from the end, from the beginning. He knows all. He's seen all. He understands all. And He knows every opportunity He's given you. 
I just want to take seriously tonight this one thought. Have I prepared my soul to meet the Savior? And am I constantly filling up my soul so that I will have my lamp ready when He calls me home? Whether it's in a moment of rapture or whether it's in the loss of life on earth, we will all meet Him face to face someday. Some will meet with joy, others with extreme sorrow and judgment. But all will look on His face as either their Lord and Savior or their master and their judge. I want to stand rapture ready. I want to make sure that I am faithful in doing what He wants me to do. I want to be prepared for the day I meet Him face to face. I want to be sure that on that day I go into eternity with Him saying, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over these little things of life. Be ruler over many. Whatever that means for eternity. I don't care if it means be ruler over an apple tree. I'll be happy with that. I'll be happy to tend to one apple tree if that's what he wants. I'll do it 24 hours. A, well, there's no time there. It's eternity. I'll do it constantly. I'll take care of whatever he gives me to take care of because I'll be happy just to be able to be there in his presence. The joy I've had in these small bursts on earth when he's come to meet with me tells me that all of eternity with that presence is worth it. As a good friend of mine used to say, he's a better high than anything the world has to offer. Think of having that for all of eternity. I want to make sure that I'm faithful in doing what he wants me to do and that he says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Are you ready? Have you done your preparation? Do you have yourself filled with the Holy Spirit and with his word? Or do you have a leak somewhere, a sin that takes God out of your life? Or maybe have you been lax in keeping up with your own soul and the maintenance you should be doing? If you have a need to repent, or at least to let God check your heart, and make sure everything's all right, you feel like God's been speaking to you and pulling you, come and pray right now. It's your chance. I hope it's not your last chance because there's a lot of people I want to give this, this same truth to as soon as I can. I want to tell my whole family, get ready. I want to keep telling them. I want them to get ready. But this might be your last chance. If you're not ready, come and get ready. He's provided the garments, the spotless robes, and He provides you with the grace to come and the grace to live it in this life. I invite you to come and make sure that you're ready for the judgment day if you're not. Let's stand. And as we close in prayer tonight, I mean this, and I mean every word of it. It's a terrible thing to think about being those five foolish virgins. Don't be there. Don't fool yourself into thinking that you can let up on a few little things and God will just excuse them and sweep them under the rug. He won't do that. He's a very loving God, but He's a very just and thorough God. He'll check every last inch of your life. There's nothing that's going to get past His, look, his, his sight. He's going to see. He's going to judge on every part of your life. <laughs>